Well, uh, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Jeff and thanks for the, to the school for, for the invitation, uh, not only for the lecture, but, but also for the, uh, the Baumer professorship. It, 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 it's, a, it's also um, incredibly interesting for me to be in this position and um, e even in some cases looking back uh, at projects that are 20 years old and, and, and kind, of, kind of, you know, thinking the arc of, of uh, I, you know, I don't want to say, you know, it's like, it's like artists getting, you know, uh, you, you don't, you don't want to have a retrospective because it means your career is over. So uh, think of it as a mid-career survey that, that at least there's another, another 20 years to, to, to come. But uh, anyway, it's, it, 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 is a, it is a pleasure and, and an, an honor. And just in, in, in the spirit of personal reminiscence, I, when I first met Jeff, I was really intimidated by Jeff, uh, as I think many people are. Um, and and it, it was only when I realized you, you, you actually, you never will win an argument with Jeff. Uh, and he, he argues with you precisely because he actually takes your idea seriously. Uh, idea seriously. Um, it, it, I, I think, I think we, we, we formed this as basis for a, a, a very uh, productive kind of, kind of exchange and, and friendship. So, all right. Um, as, as usual, I have way too many slides. Um, the structure of the lecture is probably overcomplicated, um, but I want to kind of launch into it uh, immediately. Uh, there's an argument here, but there's also an argument which is um, uh, constructed through a series of images. Do the lights get darker, or that's it? Um, uh, I mean, we can, you know, you can see the slides, but they'd be a little sharper. So, um, so the title of the lecture uh, is the geological turn, um, and that 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 notion of a kind of rethinking of uh, ar architectures mineral or geological quality is, is part of the argument of the, uh, uh, of the lecture. Um, now, part of this argument is to say that, that for the past probably 20 years, the dominant working metaphor in architecture has been biological. Um, and uh, um, that argument took two forms. On the one hand, um, very clearly articulated by uh, people like Greg Lynn, um, jumping off from the theories of Dorothy Wentworth Thompson and his dictum that form is a diagram of forces, uh, which was used to uh, describe uh, the, the, the evolution of um, natural, natural form. Um, the new tools of computer modeling uh, were used to simulate the process of, of natural form uh, generation. Now, what was significant about this work, it didn't imitate the forms of nature, it imitated the processes by which natural form uh, was produced and evolved. Uh, but I, I think there's a number of, of, of issues around that. Um, uh, for one, in, in, in very, very simply, um, is what, what we used to refer to as the stopping problem. Um, that um, once that process of form generation is frozen, you, you're then dealing with a kind of snapshot. You're not actually dealing with a vital, changing, adaptable, living uh, uh, body. There's also the, the, the practical problem of um, simulating soft bodies with hard materials. Um, so on the one hand, the claim for a kind of geological character uh, a, 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 and its relevance for contemporary architecture is a kind of claim for architecture's hard, resistant, uh, mineral character. Uh, this is um, Monel's uh, course hall in San Sebastian, Mencia Tuñol's Museum of Immigration. Um, one, of the, one of the projects that appears in Landform Building, uh, Giancarlo Mazzanti's um, uh, Biblioteca de España in, in Medellin, uh, Colombia. And one of the gratifying things about doing the Landform Building book is we were interested in this project, we, we get the material from this project, and we read his project description where he describes it as a piece of geology. Uh, so that's one of the claims uh, for the geological turn, but it's not the only claim. And 
in, in, in part to simply appeal to architecture's mineral character, to its, its hard, durable, resistant uh, character, is to miss the fluidity of geology uh, itself. The geology is a dynamic system too. It just changes very, very slowly. Um, this is um, uh, one of several maps drawn by uh, William Smith, known as the, the, the father of, of, uh, of uh, contemporary uh, geology. Um, and he's mapping the, the strata of, um, of uh, England. Uh, and um, and uh, th th there's another thing, I think, which is interesting when you, 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 you think about the biological and the uh, geological, that they both involve uh, changes over the very, very long duration. Changes that are, that are almost impossible to Im imagine. Um, we know, for example, that the Grand Canyon is the product of, of, of erosion. And in a way, we can sort of understand the physicality of that process, but we can't really imagine the time scale. So, and in fact, um, geology and evolution were equally controversial in the 19th century, precisely because of that appeal to the long duration of, uh, of change. So, so again, evolution and geology, the biological and the geological actually share that particular character, um, which, which of course is embedded in the fossil record. Uh, so the place where geology and, and, and um, uh, biology intersect, in fact, is, is the fossil uh, record. Now, but there's another, it, when I say that the dominant working metaphor in the past 20 years uh, has been biological, there's another thread besides uh, morphogenesis by, by way of, of uh, computer simulation, and that's the appeal to ecological systems. And this, of course, is something that I was sort of closer to uh, in my own thinking over the past uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, decades. Uh, in part through the work that I did with Jim Corner, um, um, thinking about how you could begin to envision large-scale landscape or urban sites as, uh, um, as uh, ecological systems that could undergo uh, emergence and uh, succession. So uh, uh, this is a diagram from, these are both diagrams from the Downsview competition in um, Gosh, was it 1999? Couldn't have been. Um, cool, yeah, good. Uh, um, um, where uh, one of the important notions of the project was that you kind of seed the site with potential, um, term which Jim Corner originally borrowed from uh, a Rem Kohlhaus, and then through a regime of management, um, you increase the diversity of the site gradually over, over time. Um, through, through the operations of, um, um, of uh, e ecology and emergence. Um, you, you know, there's a funny story about Downsview, um, which is, um, uh, we, we of course were working on our project and our statement and uh, using the language of emergence and ecology and thinking this was really gonna make our project stand out. Um, and, um, at the end, all, all, six, all six projects in, in the Downsview competition uh, either used the word emergence or, or had the word emergence in the title of the project, except the winning uh, comp competition entry by, by Bruce Mao and Rem, Rem Kohlhaus, which you could also argue was maybe the only emergent project actually in the, in the, in the scheme. So uh, I think uh, all credit is probably actually due to uh, Detlef Mertens, who wrote the brief for, for Downsview, who, who I think had the similar um, intuition that if you're thinking about large-scale urban sites, the appeal to succession, to change over time, and to, and to ecology uh, begins to be a kind of productive uh, uh, way of working and way of thinking. Now, these two streams intersected in the middle to late 1990s around the question of the surface. Um, that uh, the, the, the FOA Yokohama port terminal is nothing if not a constructed landscape. Uh, and it's a constructed landscape which then supports uh, a series of, of emergent uh, programs loosely controlled uh, around the thematic of the, uh, um, 
of the, 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 the port terminal. Uh, and uh, Diller Scofidio, I don't know if it was Diller Scofidio or Renfro at that time, their I-beam competition, um, attempts to take that, that extended horizontal surface, that surface which is more literally a landscape, and folds it up into uh, a, a, a vertical uh, building, again taking advantage of, of the potentials for different exchanges and connectivities that that, that warp surface would uh, support. Um, and, and again, I want to make the, the, the claim, um, the image on the right comes from a geologist at uh, MIT called uh, Taylor Perron. It's actually the, a still, the, the final image of a, of a video. Um, but he has done a lot of work essentially simulating uh, the, the, the process of the, the um, 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 generation, uh, formal generation of, of landscapes in a way actually quite parallel to what Greg Lynn has done with, with, with his own work. So uh, again, part of the claim here is in fact, uh, given the use of these particular tools um, and the ability of computer technologies to simulate the long duration of evolution and uh, and uh, uh, geological change uh, that uh, the, the, the operations are not all that uh, uh, different. It's just um, it, there's a different set of variables involved and rather than being object oriented here it's oriented towards uh, surfaces and uh, fields. Um, and again we saw this in a uh, series of canonical projects in the late uh, 1990s uh, such as the um, uh, Riser Umamoto uh, Westside uh, project. So all of this became codified in the late 1990s, early 2000s around the notion of landscape uh, urbanism. And I'll just run through this very, very quickly. Uh, I, uh, I, I would say there are five important working variables in landscape uh, urbanism. First of all is this claim for an infrastructural scale. That, that landscape is no longer to be confined to delimited specific sites decorating the, the plazas in front of, uh, of, of office buildings, but landscape can have a, a, a large scale structural structuring role in the city through its appeal to a territorial scale and to infrastructure. Um, and one of its primary um, uh, tools is the manipulation of uh, surface. Um, landscape architects, you, you can say, are experts in surface. And so again, you have that convergence with the computer modeling, uh, surface-based computer modeling and the expertise that belong to landscape architecture in, uh, in, in understanding and thinking about surfaces. Uh, Jim Corner used to say, you have to think about the surface like, like a farmer. You have to think about you know, where would the water sit, which surfaces get light, and so on. So one of the differences between the way landscape architects thought about surfaces and architects thought about surfaces is that the, the sort of material performative quality of the surface was predominant in uh, landscape. Third point is that that extended horizontal field becomes a field for the deployment of, of uh, uh, open-ended programs. Um, the, one of the most important lessons from landscape urbanism, again, the appeal to, uh, to ecology and succession, is the notion of, of a landscape changing over time. Um, in traditional landscape architecture, uh, a site is planted, it grows into maturity, and then it's maintained at a kind of, kind of steady state. But one of the contributions of a number of the innovative landscape architects in the 90s was to think about the process of, ev ev of ecological succession as a model for changing spatial sites, states on a site over time. So that the, 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 the growing in of the site over time could produce uh, qualitative changes as well as simply uh, quantitative. Uh, and of course there are the more sort of immediate issues like the change, change of seasons and then the large scale uh, ecological uh, shifts. And of course um, it, this is necessarily a discussion that uh, addresses the problem of, of the natural and the artificial of nature and, and, and culture. Um, 
This, this image is self-explanatory. Uh, this uh, is a construction photograph from uh, Central Park. Central Park, which we think of as a natural landscape, in fact, is a, is a, is a large-scale piece of civil engineering. It's an entirely constructed landscape. All right, I'm going I'm to show one of the uh, landscape urbanism projects before I, I sort of move on. Um, and uh, a project which is significant, I think, in some sense, in this particular context, um, uh, because it was an invited competition for a, a city south of Seoul in uh, Korea. And um, we were the only architect-led team in this particular uh, competition. And um, so uh, we were, in, in a sense, sort of pushing the large-scale infrastructural potentials of landscape urbanism, which we thought were, the, were the, the most effective response to this particular site. Uh, this is the site that was given in the competition. Uh, two artificial lakes, two, two reservoirs. Um, um, and um, there was very large-scale development planned around the southernmost of these two lakes. Um, there's a, there was a large highway being constructed right through the middle. So you had a very, in a sense, very problematic site. Uh, you, you really couldn't understand the, there, there was no natural limit to this site. It was just simply an arbitrary boundary uh, drawn probably on the basis of their ability to acquire the property. Um, and um, uh, as I said, this this large planned development. So, so it was neither sort of pristine natural site, nor was it a kind of, any kind of sense of a kind of coherent urban fabric that you could push back uh, against. So that, that was really fundamental in our thinking about, about the project, that, that how could we give this site a, 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 a viable sense of identity uh, given this very diffuse definition of the site that has been given in the in the program. Now, uh, so uh, the, the, if, if the 19th century park, the, the Olmsted Park, um, is, is defined as a kind of green void in the dense fabric of, of the city, we were dealing with a situation more like this. So we, we, we reappropriated this um, iconic project from Hans Holein where he collaged the aircraft carrier into the landscape. But if the 1960s version of that was, was sort of technology against the landscape. Our question was, can we actually turn that into a kind of green landscape infrastructure um, which will be more sympathetic to the, the, the context that is being uh, inserted into? So we, we proposed a single structure extending from the very south to the very north of the site, about two and a half kilometers long. Uh, but of course, that, that structure would adapt to the local conditions uh, on the site. Um, so we, we essentially drew a line from here and it crosses both lakes. It crosses um, this sort of lowland uh, in, in between the lakes and then it climbs up a mountain, uh, small mountain hill um, at the, the north end of the site. Um, so the, the proposition is that uh, we will take all, the, the, the other problem, the other problem was this. Again, lacking any real sense of urban fabric around it, uh, the other question was how this park would ever get activated. Who, who would ever use it? Um, so the, the other strategy is to say that if you're actually going to activate the park, you have to take all of the active programs and consolidate them onto this single line, which will, which will be an attractor that will actually bring people uh, into the park. And the consequence of that actually is that more of the site can be, can be left untouched, the, 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 the landscape can actually be restored and we'll have a greater chance of, of um, surviving as a viable uh, natural, natural landscape. So um, our, our project was perceived as a very aggressive project, but um, we, th we think it actually, by consolidating the built uh, 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 fabric onto such a small portion of the site, we, we think it actually and, uh, preserved more of the, of the site. Sorry, I keep... So, pier and a field strategy. Uh, with this, in a sense, as a kind of hard structure, this as soft uh, landscape uh, 
So this is the, this is the uh, overall plan. And again, you see that line from north to south. You see the different ways in which the, the, the pier <laughs> adapts. And then you see the various uh, landscape-based uh, uh, strategies that uh, operate around that. There's an overall view looking from the, the northern lake, which is more naturalistic, towards the south. Um, and the other thing that we, we were saying is that if, if we're going to make such a strong uh, built gesture on the site, that piece, of, that piece of structure has to do something. It has to do work that returns uh, something to uh, the, the, the natural systems on site. So uh, this um, juncture right here, this is where the highway went through. Uh, and we created a new spillway for the upper lake. Um, we created a filtri filtration system that filtered that water that served this uh, orchard here and integrated that with the ventilation tower for the uh, highway. So, um, so the, 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 the architecture is performing work. It's, it's returning something to its context. So just working from south to north, um, it was a housing, uh, a bridge, cultural programs at this point, um, and then the, the kind of middle, very active zone, but, the, but the, the, the site drops away and it creates a kind of bridge condition here at this point. Um, active programs on the roof at this point, and then this is the, this is the ventilation structure here. You can see the highway uh, running through and the spillway that then opens up into the quieter uh, northern lake um, with uh, pathways climbing up the hill and uh, a series of programs that are more dedicated towards leisure and uh, nature. So, um, so th that uh, again, the primary claim of this particular project and the way in which the landscape urbanism strategies were understood here was that if, if we were actually ever going to give this particular landscape any kind of uh, a viable uh, uh, legibility and identity, we, we needed to do so, so through a kind of strong gesture. And the idea that um, you, you accept the artificiality of the, the work on the landscape and then you work in a sense with the kind of seams between uh, the, the, the architecture uh, and uh, the landscape. Now there's another, there's another question here um, which simply has to do with scale, but scale always also has to do with, um, uh, with uh, time as well. Um, this is, a, this is another master plan that we, we finished in 2010, I believe it was, um, for um, a 600-acre um, site in uh, Taichung. Um, and of course, at the end of that process, our master plan was accepted by the city, and we were looking at a 15-year horizon of, of implementation. And you, know, you only have to add up the number of meetings that would be involved in in a 15-year uh, implementation project to, to realize that it's a kind of nightmare. Um, so we, we proposed to the mayor of Taichung that um, he should try and uh, build something um, quickly on site uh, that would bring the population of Taichung onto the site, uh, educate them about the, the, the project, and um, and e even allow them to watch the process of uh, construction. The mayor thought that was a great idea. Uh, the fact that he was term limited and was able to get this built before his term end ended um, uh, made, made a big difference. It also put a lot of pressure on us to get the building done quickly. So um, this, this building was nine months from, from signing of contract to, to opening of the, of the, of the building. Um, it's, a, it's a pavilion in which all of the drawings, models, uh, animations of the project are, are displayed, uh, and it, ha it will have a two-year uh, lifespan. Now, the other interesting story about this project is that um, initially we, um, we, we, were, we wanted to build a freestanding pavilion. Um, and it's one of those cases where um, having a small budget actually worked in our favor. Um, you know, we made some sketches and we had, we had this idea about these sort of pivoting uh, view corridors and so on. Um, 
but uh, we, we didn't have nearly enough money to, to, to build this pro project. Um, um, and it, it's an airport. Um, it had these amazing hangars. Um, you can get a sense of the scale from the tennis court. Um, it's got a really heavy concrete slab because they used to park aircraft on this, so we didn't have to build a foundation. Um, we didn't have to worry about keeping the rain out. So, um, so the, the idea that, that we would then build the temporary pavilion in the, in the hangar just seemed like a kind of no-brainer to, to, to us. So um, it's, uh, it's about 8,000 square feet. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sheathed in uh, aluminum, uh, sorry, in bamboo. Um, it, uh, and that, that, that decision had to do with, with two things. Uh, on, on the one hand, um, it was simply a pragmatic uh, uh, question of uh, an available material uh, that had local cultural resonances uh, that, that would allow for very, very quick uh, assembly but also the notion that uh, we were making thematic the temporary character of this, this pavilion. Um, I, I think that, I think that, that for me was, is very important in these kind of temporary buildings that uh, not only are there opportunities available in a temporary building that don't exist in a permanent building, that, that it, it, that, but, but the, the, that, that lightness and temporariness should somehow be made uh, thematic. So the, the working premise is that there's a kind of dense forest of bamboo. It's based on the scaffolding model that you see all over Asia. And there's a void carved out of that and a, a platform and a sequence of exhibition routes. Now, the dirty little secret of this building is that it actually has a steel frame. Um, turned out that for code reasons, even though bamboo is in fact stronger than steel, um, um, the, the uh, uh, especially, and, and actually it's better in an earthquake situation because it, it, it moves. Um, the building code simply wouldn't let us do public assembly on, on um, uh, uh, supported on bamboo. Uh, so it, it has a steel frame, but then we use the uh, typical construction and the typical module, which is 75 centimeters by 75 centimeters, uh, of the bamboo scaffolding, and that's anywhere between a meter and a half up to three meters deep, so it forms this kind of thick uh, wrapper around the uh, steel. Um, and, then, and then there's a, there's a bamboo skin uh, around the outside of that. So, uh, so you, you, you come in the hangar around here and enter, there, there are uh, presentations and area for exhibitions, the stairways take you up. I mean, again, in that spirit of keeping everything very light and making the temporary character uh, thematic, the, it, that extends to things like the strategies for lighting and the ceilings. Um, then there's this, this large set of steps which, which form a kind of auditorium. You can look from the pavilion out to the existing. This is the way it kind of dissolves into the ceiling uh, uh, up above. And uh, it, it, in fact, is very heavily used and visited uh, by, by school groups and, and, and is quite active on the, on the weekends in, um, in, in Taichung. Uh, these, are, these are photographs taken by Iwan Bon. He loves getting the, the photographs like this with these, these guys. Uh, taking down this, this uh, scaffolding here. Now, shortly after we finished that, we were, we were asked to uh, contribute to the Chen, Chengdu Biennial, and um, we essentially uh, worked with a very similar vocabulary and uh, the same, um, uh, the same uh, scaffolding. Um, uh, you know, again, the, the temporary pavilion, the same variables in need for quick construction, something that, that resonated with, with uh, local culture. But, you know, with, with biennials and pavilions, one of the things that always kind of bugs me is, you, you know, they, they exist in this realm between sculpture and architecture. They never have any life. They're never really occupied. Um, so we wanted our pavilion to be occupied. Um, so it, in fact, it is an aviary, and um, for the duration of the biennial, it was populated with, with local bird species. Um, all right, so to come back at this point to, I, I, you know, again, with that as the kind of working context um, that really had been sort of preoccupying the office uh, in the 
you know, from 2008 through 2010 to 2011, which was when the info box was finished, um, uh, which was, which was the, the context of the thinking around uh, what was initially a conference on landform building and then later uh, a book. Um, and I would say that in addition to thinking about what was going on in, in our own practice, uh, it was a response to two things sort of outside in the field. On the one hand, um, landscape urbanism, the term landscape urbanism was, was, was um, coined by Charles Waldheim in 1998 and by 2007, I believe, which was when this was built and a couple years later when the High Line was finished, I believe you could say that there, there are two canonical built versions of landscape urbanism. And one of them is Olympic Sculpture Park uh, by Manfredi Weiss. Um, it, it, again, it works with many of those variables of landscape urbanism that I talked about before. It uses folded surfaces uh, to make a new set of connections within the city. It works around and over the, the, the existing infrastructure. It creates new programmatic opportunities. Uh, it's really a very, very impressive uh, uh, work. And then, of course, the High Line in, 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 in New York. Um, but it's also, you know, it's a bit like Yokohama, that, that when there is a definitive example of a particular strategy, it kind of narrows the field. And you, you feel as if uh, your, your only other option is, is to repeat. So, so the question of what comes after landscape urbanism seemed to be in the air around 2008, 2009. Uh, and it was being asked by the landscape architects as well. Um, but also looking at uh, the, the field, and just noticing the predominance of artificial mountains in, uh, in architectural production. Eisenman Santiago building, uh, this is Ito's crematorium. Very literal mirroring here between the, 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 the roof of the building and, and, and the hills. Uh, <laughs> Piano's uh, Science Center. I could, I could show you another hundred examples of softly rounded mounds in the, in the landscape. Um, so, on the one hand, the Landform Building book was a, an, an effort to come to terms with this phenomenon that was happening in the field, but also to expand the vocabulary of, of Landform Building, um, to contextualize it historically. Uh, the notion of the artificial mountain is something which is very deeply embedded in the history of the discipline, as Bruegel's painting. Uh, but it's something you know you see uh, very much in, in, in different versions of contemporary architecture. Um, you can trace a genealogy back to the 1960s. Uh, Jean Renaudi, very interesting and underknown uh, architect practicing in Paris in the uh, 1960s, and you know I, I simply kind of interested in the kind of immediacy of simply piling up stuff. Um, uh, this is. Um, um, uh, Ahmed Cerro Nueve, uh, a project for um, a uh, mountain of roses as a kind of covering for a, 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 I think, power station. I think it was a competition for somewhere in Iowa, actually. So, so as I said, landform building was in part an attempt to, to both come to terms with this phenomenon, give it a, a, a wider kind of theoretical context, but also to open the vocabulary up. A, a, a little bit. So uh, I'm not going to go into the book in detail. I hope you buy it and uh, instead. Um, but one of, but this this is this is a fold out from the end of the book, which uh, lays out the the four different working categories of the book: form or artificial mountains, uh, scale or the megaform, uh, process and uh, and atmosphere. Uh, as, as four different categories of landform building, um, uh, again, in this, this attempt to kind of open up the, the working vocabulary. But underlying this is, an, again, uh, an argument about the turn from the biological analogy to the geological uh, analogy. And you will notice how many of these terms, cliffs, canyons, uh, boulders, shards, peaks, hills, 
are, are, are actually uh, geological uh, terms. Um, one of the things that we did in the book was to integrate projects by visual artists, uh, this beautiful series of, of found photographs by uh, Tacita Dean, um, and uh, Chris Taylor and the, um, the um, uh, what is his group called? The um, um, Land Arts Program at, um, uh, thank you, yes. <laughs> I knew it was up there, up there somewhere. Um, uh, and uh, they, this, the, you can't see this image, but if you buy the book, it's a very detailed image. Uh, they, they, um, they, they did a laser scan of Michael Heiser's du du double negative. So uh, I, again, it's when you take, and what's interesting to me about this is that when you take the double negative, for example, and you bring it into the realm of a laser scan, you begin to approach the geological at a different level. You begin to approach the geological from the inside out, from the kind of molecular level. You think about things like crystal formation, for example, um, and the, the way in which those processes um, are working at, at, at the, the, the microscopic level um, are a process of form generation not dissimilar but also at the macro scale as well. Of course, all of the vocabulary and the tools and the categories of, of, um, uh, of, of geology uh, to describe operations like this that in fact are the, the product of dynamic changes in, in the landscape uh, itself. So um, one of the things that we did in the book is to make a kind of graphic index which would um, uh, catalog all of those different uh, uh, operations and use them in a way as a, 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 a way to categorize all of the, the projects in the, in, in, in the book. So um, this, was, uh, this was an early version of little um, uh, models that we made of all the projects that, that were, were being included uh, in, in, in the book. So, so uh, one of the ways then to contextualize the last three projects I'm, I'm going to show, the, the last three projects are in a way after landform. Um, and they represent work in our own practice, uh, kind of beginning to jump off from some of the, the theoretical and uh, curatorial insights of the landform building book. Um, and begin to work out the implications in uh, our own practice. So I'm going to end by, by showing uh, three competition projects that start to develop a line of thinking in our work that, that I would refer to as, as, a, as the kind of geological. Uh, and the first of these is the competition for the, uh, the new art gallery for the city of Maribor. Uh, Maribor uh, is a, a small city, it's a, a sort of second uh, town after Ljubljana in uh, Slovenia. It's a very well preserved um, uh, Eastern European uh, city. This, this is the site of the project. Uh, this, this is the center of the historical uh, city. Uh, this is what the site looks like. But the, the, the town itself is very intact, very well preserved, and has this very characteristic uh, sloped, uh, tile uh, roof. Now, as we were reading the brief and looking at the, at the, the site documentation, it, it became evident to us that there was a kind of contradiction here. That um, on the one hand, they wanted a progressive new institutional identity, a gallery for contemporary art, something that would be identifiable as a kind of symbol of the progressive uh, thinking of the, of the city. On the other hand, it was being inserted into this fairly delicate historical uh, context. And how could we create a project that, that could really accomplish both of those uh, potentially contradictory uh, goals? Now, um, we were convinced you don't do it by simply imitating the form of the old city. Uh, that kind of outdated notion of contextualism no longer interest, doesn't interest many people in the room, I, I, I suspect. But one of the things that gives the old city its quality is, in fact, the, the repetition of roughly similar forms um, 
over the, the, the dimension of the given plot lines, uh, which create simultaneously both consistency, yet variety and uh, uh, texture. So, so the, the question was, could we do something similar with uh, the, new, the new institution? That is to say, with some sort of identifiable repetitive dimension uh, that would both repeat yet produce variation, uh, but that as an aggregation would actually produce this, this uh, identifiable new uh, image for the site. Then there, then there was also a response to the program. That is to say that the program, uh, and there's nothing unusual about this, but the museum program consisted of fairly large scale public programs that need openness and uh, large floor plates, um, and the, the exhibition which needs a certain rhythm, it needs a certain modularity uh, for, for curatorial and, and cir circulation uh, purposes. So, so the, the idea of kind of lifting it up, creating a kind of continuous field that connects to the city below and then in the, the exhibition program, which you know, again, this, this is an extroverted program. It wants to connect out to the city. The, the exhibition program is, is, an, is an introverted program. It, it wants to focus attention and contemplation uh, inside. So, so those two insights pushed us in this direction of a kind of um, uh, solution based on the aggregation of, of parts that would produce uh, some, some kind of complex uh, whole. Um, this was a uh, uh, statement by um, um, my friends um, uh, Luis Mencia and Emilio Tunyon in an interview. They talked about some of their recent projects in terms of non-centralized expansive systems capable of becoming specific at each point. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's also a pretty good definition of what I call field conditions. Um, uh, a grid is a, a grid is a non-centralized expansive system, um, but the grid is the same at any given point. So uh, I think I'm not alone in this interest in looking for systems that can be extensive and make that those those horizontal connections yet can find a degree of local specificity. Uh, and, and, and local uh, uh, differences. Um, so this is one of, one of the earliest sketches. Um, this was a diagram which um, um, my colleague at the time, Ed Eigen, uh, sent to me after seeing a presentation of the project. Um, these are uh, speciation diagrams. This is the Linnaean uh, framework where uh, you, you have a continuous field and the divisions are, are effectively arbitrary. Uh, here you have archipelagos. These are the two interesting ones. Uh, that is to say, you have a defined condition here, yet you have the potential of exchange with, with adjacent uh, cells. Um, this sketch preceded that. But, so this, this was our sort of first, my sort of first intuition of, of the site. That got codified through a number of different studies into a series of uh, pentagonal units, each one of which has an identical uh, footprint, but can, uh, in their three-dimensional expression, develop a high degree of variation and specificity that can then begin to be aggregated and, in this particular case, end up being aggregated into 15 different units that are, 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 are situated on the site, with a, I would say, with a very, fairly casual relationship uh, to the site. But the, the notion that um, the, 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 the spaces that, would, w that we would create would have something of the character, again, of the kind of fine-grained uh, spaces typical of, of the traditional uh, European city. Um, so you see here, this, this is a photograph of the finished, finished model, um, and uh, that, that the, the, um, the, the roof line does make some uh, oblique reference but not obvious reference to uh, the, the, the very typical uh, uh, tiled roofs, um, but that, that this dimension which is repeated within the project is very closely related to the typical plot dimension and so somehow we, 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 we I think we were able to create something with a very clear contemporary 
uh, institutional identity as a new uh, uh, part of, of the city, yet knit it into the, the existing uh, fabric of the city. And we did so precisely through this repetitive modular strategy, uh, each one of which, uh, through the process of the developed surface, uh, creates high degrees of variation and then become aggregated one to the next. Uh, it's, it's, it's very significant that, that the, 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 the working form is a pentagon because pentagons uh, can't be closely packed and they therefore uh, leave these triangular voids which allow light uh, to come down. And, and also, again, they don't, they, don't make, they, don't, they don't close the building down and make it a, a kind of solid mass. They, they, again, keep that sense of openness and uh, porosity uh, in the building. Uh, each one of these pieces, now again, if you remember that, 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 that diagrammatic sketch at the beginning, but this, this whole thing is lifted up um, almost as if it were a piece of infrastructure. Each one of these um, pentagonal units comes down to a single structural column. This is the plan that's repeated for uh, each unit. And uh, the effect then is that you, you, you get a kind of tessellated uh, a grid where, in fact, the individual units disappear. That, that, that through, through the geometric logic which emerges from the structure of the individual unit, uh, this larger sort of, sort of net uh, 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 begins to, to, to appear. So that's, that's where you, that's you see in this sort of large scale study model the quality of that space underneath. So this is the ground floor plan. Uh, and, and the kind of interdigitated perimeter that allows for, for really extensive perimeter and uh, brings you close to the inside of the building. Here you see the, the courts that are dropping down and of course all the typical public programs, libraries and cafes and so on at the ground floor of the building. Here you see the underside of that structure and a kind of corrugated metal rain screen because all the lighting comes from uh, above. And then the upper uh, gallery levels, again, um, um, uh, this is the, this is the uh, lower level where you see up to the skylights and the, and the, 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 the smaller galleries up here. But again, the, the galleries themselves are, are, have very, very generous, very clean uh, uh, white walls. There's a potential of very different kinds of exhibition layouts. And then at the upper level, the lower level is temporary gallery, the upper level is um, uh, paintings and photography, so you're, you're much closer to the, the skylight system, the ceiling height is lower, and those galleries have a more intimate uh, feel. Um, so uh, that's the first of these, these competitions, and where, you know, again, we were really, we, 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 were, we, we, we come, somehow came back to these notions of geology and field conditions, uh, but really, primarily in response to the problem given uh, by the, the brief. The next, the next competition that we did where we, we were really interested in kind of building on some of these uh, questions um, was um, uh, a competition for um, the uh, uh, Busan, Busan Opera House in uh, South, South Korea. Uh, Busan is an industrial city uh, which uh, they actually continue to have a pretty strong uh, industrial base to their, to their uh, working economy, but like many industrial towns, they're looking towards a kind of post-industrial future, uh, part of which it, it revolves around uh, filling a very large portion of the, of the uh, port uh, and creating um, cultural programs and, and new housing. So we, we are not responsible for this kidney bean shaped island, which is uh, uh, given, uh, this, is, this is the rough layout of the, the, um, the landfill that's proposed for this area. And so somehow at the centerpiece of this new uh, landfill is, is to be uh, a, a new opera house. Clearly they, they had in mind the, the precedent of the Sydney Opera House, the idea of the opera house as the, the iconic uh, piece uh, for the city on the, on the water. Um, now, as we were, we were searching for a kind of working metaphor for the project, we, we, we came upon this, this definition. Um, 
An erratic, as you can see, an erratic, I'm not going to read it. I hate when people read things that are up on the PowerPoints. Like, it's, like if, you guys, as if you guys can't read. Um, um, you can read this. You, you can read the definition of what an erratic is. An erratic is basically a rock that's in the wrong place. And again, thinking, even thinking somewhat critically about the, the premise of you know, using the uh, opera house as this very spectacular icon for the new development, this, this seemed like a kind of interesting working metaphor uh, for us. So the idea that, uh, and, and also uh, Busan has these very, very beautiful mountains in the, in the background. The city is built at the foot of the mountains on the, on the sea. So the idea that a piece of the mountain ends up between the city and the sea um, is, was the kind of, kind of working, uh, is what, what, what Alejandro would call the alibi of the, of the project. Um, now, uh, again, of course, I mentioned the, the certainly the, um, the uh, 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 try, try, try this. Google Opera House, click on images, about 95 of the first 100 images are going to be Sydney Opera House. It's really, it's really quite exceptional how it's come to dominate our, uh, our, our notion of the, the iconicity of the, of the Opera House. So, so in a way, you can't get away from that. Um, um, of course, there, there are two things that are interesting about opera. I mean, um, if the Maribor project allowed us to explore a kind of field strategy and the aggregation of similar parts into some new, new notion of the whole, uh, opera is all about focused, concentrated attention. It's a singular program. It's a hierarchical program. You can't do a field conditions opera house, trust me. Uh, so uh, we, we had to, in some sense, take account of traditional opera. Yet, on the other hand, of course, I mean, I don't know if we call Einstein on the beach contemporary. It just, they just did a 20th anniversary, 20, 30th anniversary, I think. Uh, 30, 25th, 78. 35. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's as contemporary as my sense of opera gets. But, uh, but again, I wanted to you know, emphasize that, that you, know, you, you, you do have to think of opera as a, as a living tradition, not not simply uh, this. And then, of course, not to forget that, that, that Busan is a, a, a thriving uh, uh, contemporary global, global metropolis. So, well, if there's another iconic opera house, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's Beirut. Um, and, and we're very interested to, to find, uh, Beirut apparently was originally uh, meant to be a temporary building. Um, and it, it, uh, uh, we, were, we were interested to find this little kind of barn-like structure, which is the fly tower here. Um, we were looking at that and we realized, well, actually, that's a pentagon. Uh, that's a five-sided figure if you turn it on its side. So, so we, we sort of went with that, with that little monopoly house piece as our working piece. So in a way, you could say that, that this project is a kind of wager. We can't do a field conditions opera house, but could this strategy of aggregation be made to work with such a hierarchical singular program as the, the Opera House? So, so we start combining that, and then you get this piece, which is a little bigger, which allows for the auditorium, and then these pieces, which allow for all of the secondary programs and support programs. So this, this becomes the working uh, diagram for the, uh, for the Opera House. Uh, basically, auditorium, stage and backstage, so support programs here, additional public programs here, um, and uh, a study model from the, from the office. Study models always look better than the final models. Um, now, with that little monopoly piece, we can take the vertices and we can move them up and down in space, um, which creates a, a, a level of, of, um, of complexity and then there's a complex operation which has to do with turning the piece 90 degrees and putting it on top of uh, one of the others, whoops, which opens up space in the section. So if in the Maribor project, by the U but when, the, when you aggregate the pentagons, you get the voids in plan that bring light down. Here, because of the more compact nature of the program, 
We were interested in getting some sort of openness in, in the section, which we get by, by this, this operation. So, uh, so the notion that, that we're creating this, this rock-like piece, uh, but we're doing so actually still out of, so there still is a kind of part to whole uh, relationship here, uh, which um, this is a kind of poor man's animation here. Uh, where you see the working model being assembled uh, in the office. Uh, this is that operation where the, you, you, you see where the pieces uh, create the, the sectional voids begin to come in. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the basic of the platform. So uh, this is the final, final project. And the basic distribution of program. Uh, auditorium, uh, banquet hall, uh, rehearsal rooms, uh, within these sectional voids, a big terrace overlooking the, the harbor, and uh, outdoor performance uh, and, and administration in the bridge, and uh, the high-end restaurants in the bridge above uh, that piece. So um, basically, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a more complex formal language than our other uh, projects, but, but that really is in response to the complexity of the program itself. That, that there are many parts and pieces to that program, and it's not like we wanted to kind of give each one of them a kind of legible identity, but uh, the, the, the complexity of the form allows us to accommodate all of those complex uh, pieces. So this is the, this is the main um, uh, performance level. Uh, the audience enters here, uh, the foyers, the hall, and then these uh, backstage and fly tower pieces, which are really pretty, pretty fixed. Uh, public spaces and support spaces uh, back there. Uh, the foyer is really a kind of, kind of vertical piece that looks back over the city. And then um, the, the plan of those upper terrace levels where we, we occupy the section and look back out over the uh, harbor. So, that, uh, that piece is right there, and here you see the, the, the auditorium, uh, the, the voids that are brought down, uh, and the, the, the entry to the main uh, auditorium there. Um, now, a little bit of an interlude here, um, um, that simultaneous to these two projects, um, I, I was approached by uh, some older clients of mine. I had built this house for them, uh, actually, the first house I ever built, 1999, it was, was finished in Cold Spring, New York. And uh, they were interested in doing an addition, and, and uh, the, the client is a working artist. She wanted a, a studio uh, up, upstate uh, in their, their weekend house. So, um, so uh, this, this is the existing house to the left and the new house here. And the important thing is that uh, it was an opportunity to, again, to explore that pentagon the, the pentagonal plan and some of the formal language of the Marabor project in, uh, in, a, in a built project. So that's the existing house from 99. Um, this is the new studio. Um, and then the connecting piece, uh, you, you can see this very, very um, abrupt level. There's, well, there's a full height level change between here and here. Uh, so this, this foyer piece, uh, has to has sorry has to has to negotiate that that level change. So um, so there there you see the the, the imprint of the pe pentagonal uh, studio. And by the way, I mean there is a logic to this because this artist actually works from projection. And by take so instead of having a square studio, by taking that one wall and opening it up, you you actually create. Uh, um, the, the distance necessary for uh, projection. So, uh, you know, I was talking with the, with the students in the seminar. The Pentagon is a really interesting um, uh, uh, figure. Um, you don't find pentagons in nature. Nature is full of triangles and hexagons. Um, Pentagon is a very, it's a very unnatural uh, figure, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that. It's, it's, it's an unstable figure. Uh, so it's the simplest unstable figure. So you take the state, you know, the, the triangle is stable, square is stable, you add one more side to the square, 
and you get the, the unstable form of the pentagon, you add one more side to that, you're, you're back to hexagons and triangles. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this um, uh, pentagonal geometry. I don't know how long we can, we can keep um, milking that uh, 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 vein, but uh, it, 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 it is something that, that continues to be interesting. And as I said, had a, you, you know, it, 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 it really works in this, in this particular uh, studio. I, it, it's the simplest way to create a kind of dynamism to that otherwise uh, fixed space without, in, in my mind, kind of over complexifying. So, so this, is the, this is the studio, this is the, the, the upper level. Uh, we're fixing this awful pavement, we're doing the landscaping right. The house is essentially finished, we're, we're just working on the landscape. So this is the view from above and, and you can see that it's, it's relatively small there. But then from above, it's actually 40 feet from, from here to here and you see the quotation of that triangular skylight from the Marabor project. So the existing house here, uh, the connective piece here, the garage underneath and the studio here. Um, that photograph's about a, about a month old, so. Okay, last project. Um, and, and in, a, in a way, the project where we um, took this, um, uh, for, for various reasons, which I hope will become clear in the, in the course of the presentation, where, where we really made the geological analogy uh, the, uh, uh, really, really, really thematic uh, to the project. Um, we were shortlisted for this competition. Um, it was for a, a monument to uh, freedom and equality um, in the city of Leipzig in uh, former East, East Germany. Um, this is uh, the, the historical center of, of Leipzig um, and our site was here, as you can see, immediately outside of the traditional uh, center. Um, this is uh, our site uh, at the turn of the century. Again, very coherent language of uh, urban, uh, of civic architecture and squares. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Uh, again, it's typical early 21st century kind of non-place um, with, you know, big uh, ring roads and uh, transport. And um, uh, right now it's under construction with a, with a subway line running, running uh, through it. Yeah, you can see, see it here. So, Subway line is running like this. That limits us to very uh, uh, restricted areas of the site. This is the only, this is a library, state library. It's the only building left of that, that kind of 19th century fabric that once was part of this. There, there, there are proposals for a market here and a church here. Um, and the city, the city is down uh, that way. So it's a monument really to commemorate this event. Um, the, 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 the protests that took place culminating in October of 1989 with the fall of the, of, of the Berlin, Berlin Wall. Um, and uh, 70,000 people in Leipzig alone came out onto the streets to, uh, to protest. So again, this problem of the one and the many, of the crowd, uh, is already implicated in, in the program. And that, 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 that was very uh, uh, interesting to us. Um, how, however, thinking, I mean, in, in some sense, it was, it was hard to get away from this as a kind of precedent, um, um, certainly with my own interest in field conditions and so on. Um, uh, uh, but that, that somehow the monumental tradition is poised between, on the one hand, the singularity and the hierarchy of the traditional monument and the, the, the pure field condition of Eisenman's uh, Berlin uh, monument. Now, it is important to say that um, the, the Eisenman uh, project commemorates a very different um, uh, event. And I think the, the austerity, the, 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 the muteness, the, the lack of figuration in the Eisenman uh, monument is, 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 is completely appropriate. Um, given that we were commemorating a, a, an optimistic event, um, the, the, the austerity and unforgiving quality of this didn't seem appropriate. On the other hand, we know we can't go back to this. So the, the, somehow the problem was to, 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 to 
operate between the field and the figure, between something that could provide a kind of recognizability, that, that could provide a kind of sense of the collective memory and, and commemoration, yet at the same time not simply fall back into kind of the sentimentality of the, of the traditional. Whoops, what did I do there? Um, uh, sorry. Um, hit the wrong button. Um, so, the, the, again, the working analogy that we, that we came to was this notion of the kind of uh, the, the, the monument in process, the, 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 um, the, the, the sense of not being sure uh, if um, the monument has fallen or if the monument is still in construction. That if we could if we could, could sort of catch that sweet spot where there was an ambiguity, was it something uh, uh, that, that was that between, in a sense, between the ruin um, and, and even, even thinking about the events of, of, of 1989, that, um, that violence and resistance is, is somehow necessary in, in, in protest, yet uh, this optimistic hope of the kind of collective construction of a new society is, is, is also implied. So, so this analogy, this is Canaletto's painting called The Stone Yard and uh, we, we appropriated that as the title for the project. The, the idea that it was a monument that was, was, it was uncertain as to whether it was falling into ruin or still in the process of uh, construction. Um, now, we did that by working with the Pentagon um, uh, and the, 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 the pen pentagonal shape was, um, was, was um, voided by, uh, you, when you see the plan, you'll see that there are a series of, of, of axes on site uh, that, that became important. Uh, so that, that broke down this, the singular figure uh, and then again, through working in, in this case, with, with, with reference back to the, um, uh, the, the traditions of, of stereotomy and, and uh, uh, stone cutting, the idea that then there were a further series of operations. Um, uh, so we, we, we start with, a, with a, the complete pentagon, it's deformed, we subtract out those voids, uh, and then there are a series of cutting and rotating and uh, flipping operations, translation, cutting and translation operations um, that begin to create this sort of open field of, of parts that, that hopefully if we've been successful um, find that moment where it's amb ambivalent as to whether it's falling into ruin or still in the process of construction. So this is just the summation of all of those geometric operations in that uh, line. This is the plan, so you can see this is the area where the subway is, where it was impossible to build. Um, there's a kind of concentration of mass towards the city, so when it's viewed from here, you have a fairly conventional sort of pyramidal monumental condition, and then as you move uh, out towards the periphery, you get this kind of field of fragments. Uh, so that's just the, that. So uh, this is the model collaged into the site in its current condition. Um, where you see that kind of peak facing back uh, towards the city and then this sort of field of fragments which of course can be inhabited by uh, uh, the, the, the people of the city. So this is the view from there. Um, you begin to see then the ways in which rather than having a kind of scripted um, narrative for it, uh, the idea that, that, that people can find uses and create, opportunistically create events within uh, the field of fragments of the project. So uh, certain views uh, back towards the Rathaus are very consciously framed. Uh, that's one of the axes, but then there are moments when it, it just becomes much more informal, much more local. Uh, there you see that, that very conscious axial framing in, in this particular place. That's that, that axis here. But even there, it gets intruded upon by the, the, the different fragments of the project. And again, it breaks down and coalesces in very different ways as you move, move here. So, um, so as I said, this is the project where uh, because 
again, um, the, the, the nature of, I mean, everybody knows, I hope everybody knows Adolf Loos's famous um, um, statement about the, the only part of architecture that belongs to art is the tomb and the monument. Um, that um, working, working in the, the, the realm of the monument, that this, this sort of hard, resistive, durable, uh, material condition of the, the architecture seemed to us to, to really, really best kind of, kind of capture the, the, the qualities uh, that we were looking for in the monument, which, which in fact uh, does need to um, uh, endure o over time. So thank you very much. I'll tell you. <laughs> It all depends on the kind of work we get. I, um, I, I guess I, sh I should probably preface it by saying that, that you know, in a more detailed lecture on, on landscape urbanism, I, I would have talked about this, this idea of the thick 2D. So that um, the, 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 the pure 2D was never quite as interesting uh, to us. Um, but uh, so, you know, I don't want to say we're giving up on anything. I, I think you know, part of what, you know, as, as working architects, we want to have as many tools in our toolbox as, as, as possible, but I, I, I will say that, that I'm somewhat less interested in the horizontal at, 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 at this point. Um, I mean, um, Too many meetings, too few fees. Yeah, well, but it's not only that. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, look, um, uh, I don't know if, if I'm, you know, repeating what Alejandro might have said in a lecture or, or, or something here, but, you, you know, um, I, was, I was very interested, in, and Alejandro played out some of this research uh, at, at Princeton, but um, when Alejandro started talking about the building envelope, you know, this was a really interesting uh, moment, right? Because, you know, here is one of the authors of the canonical horizontal surface project, um, uh, saying, well, wait a second, maybe borders and boundaries and limits are actually important. Um, so, and I, I think that, that was a product of a number of different uh, th uh, things, many of which I actually share with, with Alejandro. Um, you know, in, in the 90s, we were all in love with smoothness and connectivity. Um, and so there was, you know, architectural connectivity, right? Folded surfaces and ramps and so on. Um, but also, you know, this was the sort of early days of the web and the internet and the notion that, that there was somehow an analogy between smooth connectivity locally in, in, a, in a building and the ability to sort of seamlessly connect a, a, around the web. Uh, I think many people, myself, Alejandro and others, are, are a little bit skeptical of those utopian politics of connectivity and smoothness and that borders and boundaries are simply going to disappear. I mean, we know for a fact, looking at global politics, that borders and boundaries are more contested than ever today. Um, and again, if we think about architecture, one, one of the key expertise of the field is actually the creation of borders and boundaries and limits. So, so in part, it's, a, it's, 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 it's part and parcel of that kind of larger rethinking, I think, um, and um, attention to the vertical. Um, that, uh, I mean, again, um, um, uh, you know, um, I, I was educated, you know, in the sort of heyday of postmodernism, right? When the, the paradigmatic drawing 
was the, the rendered elevation, uh, colored pencil on yellow tracing paper. As you guys don't recall, but some people in the room recall. And you know, that was what our generation reacted against, right? Um, and I wonder sometimes if we threw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We, we're interested in plan and organization and section. And of course, you know, again, think about the 90s and the, the, the uh, elevation as revealed section, right? Um, and so, so many projects, right? So, so I think th this, re this rediscovery of not only of, of, of the vertical, but also the sort of iconic figure of the building on the landscape, uh, something that, that John Haydick did very well, for example. Um, it, so, uh, I mean, these are things that, again, I wouldn't want to say I'm giving up on the horizontal, but I think some of the more urgent issues today revolve around the, the iconic figure of the building on the landscape and the, 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 the uh, borders and boundaries and, and the building envelope. Okay, so, um, one of the things that you're uh, lecture is clearly um, the contrasting of a geological analogy with a, uh, for architecture, with a biological analogy for architecture. And I'd like to go back to the uh, Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yours is very clearly geological, his is very clearly biological. Right. But I think that what they have in common is at least as interesting as what they don't. For example, mm -hmm. uh, they both use like shifts in scale, which appears on the third of fabric, both contrast in color, right. both float above the ground plane. And perhaps most importantly, they both bring a domesticated nature and collage that into the city. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a key question, and um, I, well, I, I think it's a, I think it's important. I mean, I, the, the only, the only, the only point I would, I would question is I, I don't see, I mean, well, if, if you, if you think of nature as encompassing geology, then yes, it's bringing a kind of nature to, to the, to the city. So, um, and again, I, I, I think our, I mean, I, you know, clearly the Peter Cook building is invested in its difference to the site. I, I think we're playing what in my mind is a more subtle game, which is that yes, it's different, but there are underlying structural uh, uh, similarities that'll actually allow it to be reinserted into the city in a, in a you know, no, it, I mean, it's never gonna disappear into the city, we're not interested in disappearing into the city, but, 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 um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, but I think the, 
the, the, the larger question about how we approach nature in the 21st century, I think, continues to be an interesting one. Do you think, I mean, I I think, do you think those, any of these projects are about nature? That's a that's a fair question. That's a fair question. Um, I think that I mean it's it was something that in in the, the yeah yeah the yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know you're 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 right. You're right. I, I it's it's true. I, I didn't want to win this argument. Yeah yeah. Yeah, all the good stuff was this morning. So. <laughs>